Okay. Welcome to the Ossington Circle. I'm here today with Eva Bartlett from the International Solidarity Movement. We're going to talk about Gaza. Okay, Eva. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Uh, okay. So I, I actually was in Gaza in 2002 for a few days, and I was like you with the International Solidarity Movement, but you've spent much longer in Gaza over the past few years. How, how long have you spent in Gaza? Um, cumulatively, it's about three years. Three years over yeah. the past... Oh, since November 2008. Since November 2008. Yeah. And so what kinds of changes have you seen over the past six years of your time spending time there? You know, um, just before I answer that, I wish that I had had the opportunity to see Gaza, say, in 2002 or in the 90s, mm -hmm. um, to be able to compare how it was back well, then can, when you saw it. We can compare notes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I've been told by Palestinians and by people who visited Gaza mm -hmm. that back in the time that you saw it, it probably was a lot more thriving. There was maybe construction and, um, you know, new projects and a better economy, certainly more freedom, although the Israeli occupation was physically present then. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, in the past, since 2008, it's just gotten worse and worse. I mean, they, uh, they're physically, they're locked down under a siege. Um, mm. There's no freedom of movement. And then, of course, Israel has waged a number of wars and many attacks on Gaza, destroying infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the unemployment um, has been steadily increasing. So anywhere, you know, maybe back in your day, I don't know if it was at 30% or what it was, but mm -hmm. if, for the past six years, it's been at least 35 to 40% unemployment. So when so, you combine that with the attacks and, you know, lack of um, goods entering Gaza, it's uh, really gotten to be like a stalemate, a stagnant situation where people are suffering quite a bit. Well, when I went, I actually went through uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. I went through, a, a, it was a kind of a terminal. I know that it's all terminals now. When I was there, it was mostly checkpoints, mm -hmm. but it was, it was a, kind of an earlier terminal. And uh, I, I, I understand that that's almost impossible. Israel won't let anybody go to Gaza through Israel anymore. Is that, have you been going through Israel? Um, no, I haven't. Um, I'm not allowed to enter Israel. I was wow. deported in 2007, so I, it might be a lifetime ban for all I know. But right. um, I do think that people affiliated with the larger NGOs, like the Red Cross, mm -hmm. are able to get in or um, Save the Children, or you know, some of the bigger ones. But as far as journalists, I'm not sure. Maybe the BBC, maybe the Guardian. Um, but as far as individuals, no, I would say not, not so easy. And so um, I, know, <laughs> I know from my experience in 2013 that people going through Egypt also have a difficult time, increasingly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there's a, there's a there's a general kind of policy by Gaza's neighbors, by the, you know, neighbors of all the Palestinian, all the places where Palestinians live, but, mm. but especially Gaza, I think, of preventing people, ordinary exchange, um, the exchange of ideas, of journalists, of information, from getting, uh, from occurring between Gaza and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, how do you, have, can you maybe talk about, about that, about how you've perceived that and lived that? Yeah. Well, so I, as you may know, I entered Gaza first with the Free Gaza Movement. Mm -hmm. And so their whole origin was based on the fact exactly what you're saying, that Israel and Egypt are, um, were locking down Gaza, and they mm -hmm. still are at this time. Um, and so their idea was that if, if people are not able to enter via Israel or by Egypt, then, and Gaza has no airport anymore, of course, since right. it was bombed, then people should be able to at least enter and Palestinians should be able to leave by their waters. So, you know, they sailed from Cyprus to Gaza. Um, and they did so five times successfully. And then the Israeli Navy started uh, violently preventing boats from reaching uh, the Gaza Strip. So, and many people know of the, the case in, I think it was the end of May or beginning of June um, 2010, when the Israeli commandos boarded yeah. the Mavi Marmara and mm -hmm. other boats in the Freedom Flotilla, and they, they brutally cracked down on passengers, killing nine people and injuring many, many more. Um, 
so yeah, after that, there was a bit of a lapse where under the Mubarak government, um, the Rafah crossing into Egypt was opened more. Mm -hmm. And it was actually possible for internationals to enter via Egypt, whereas before it was virtually impossible. But um, since July 2013, there was a military coup in Egypt, and now there's a military government um, in, in power, and they're enforcing Mubarak-like policies. Even worse, they at least Mubarak didn't destroy all the tunnels. And from what I understand, they've destroyed, I, I've read, all but 10% of the tunnels that were running from Egypt to Gaza. So it is now uh, virtually a complete lockdown by Israel, by Egypt, and even the tunnels now are inaccessible. And the tunnels have become this... this strange thing where uh, it's like it's bad enough in my mind to expect an entire population of one one and a half million people to and conduct their entire economic life through underground tunnels mm -hmm. but that's almost become an argument like well they have the tunnels so um, why should they you know why sh what there's no siege anymore because of the tunnels but in fact um, not only, not only do the tunnels not offer a legitimate substitute for an, a full kind of open economic life, but mm -hmm. also they're they're now trying to destroy them, and they're in a process of continually kind of closing them. And people who go through them are in quite a lot of danger. Precisely, yeah. And um, so, I mean, the the vast majority of these tunnels, um, when they did exist. Sure, there were some larger tunnels through which automobiles were coming, or mm -hmm. even livestock. And those are the stories you always hear, right? Like, oh, well, they take ta they take cars through the tunnels, but but they, I, w I mean, I don't know the percentage, but I would say the vast majority are the smaller tunnels which I've seen, mm -hmm. which you have to stoop into yeah. when you walk through, and you have to avoid the electrical wiring because people get electrocuted yeah. from that, and you, you always have the danger of the Israeli um, air force bombing you. Yeah. or a tunnel collapsing because they are so close to one another and even over top of one another that the walls often cave in. So they, they yeah, they allowed in and out um, things that Israel and Egypt were prohibiting, but they were not safe. Mm -hmm. The goods that came in through the tunnels were inevitably more expensive, mm -hmm. um, and, and people going in and out would have to pay the tunnel yeah. operators, obviously. It's a business. So it's not, you know, not everybody could have used the tunnels, and there was always the risk if you are caught by Egypt exiting a tunnel, you can be arrested. And for a Palestinian to be arrested in Egypt, that's, yeah. you know, hell on earth. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about this idea of prohibited goods. So Israel actually prevents certain categories of goods, certain whole classes of commodities from actually reaching Gaza. They're prohibited from entering Gaza. Mm -hmm. What are some of these goods? Um, at the height of the, the banning on items entering Gaza, Israel was banning all but 40 items from entering Gaza. So things that were banned included um, seeds and fertilizers and livestock and baby formula, diapers, toys, A4 paper, um, spices. And I always kind of joke that I think it was John Kerry that got indignant when he found out that pasta was banned. So he got that changed, so that pasta was then allowed into Gaza. Baby formula, bad pasta. Essential. Essential. Okay. <laughs> and another interesting thing about um, items which are allowed into Gaza, so Israel does allow things like luxury chocolates into Gaza. So if you go to a supermarket, you know, in Gaza City, you'll find um, lint or you know, mm -hmm. uh, Kit Kat or whatever. Um, and so this is seen as like, oh well, Gazans, Palestinians in Gaza have a good standard of living. Right. 80% of the population depends on food aid for their survival. They can't afford these chocolates, but what they really need are the things that would enable their lives um, to be healthy, like the, the things that would help farmers, like the seeds and the fertilizers or the livestock, mm -hmm. instead of having to buy fruits and vegetables from Israel or meat that's imported from Israel. But the most notable um, goods that are still prohibited almost exclusively are construction materials. So um, when you consider that <clears throat> Excuse me. In the 2008 and 9 attacks, something like 4,000 plus homes were destroyed, and 16,000 were badly damaged. Um, and many of these homes have not been rebuilt yet. 
and then you have intermittent attacks after that, and then you have the attacks in November 2012, further destruction of homes and hospitals and medical clinics and bridges and roads and universities and, you know, everything that you can imagine. Um, and people have not been able to rehabilitate many of these places. Then you have normal population growth and the need to um, just to build homes to, to accommodate for growing families. And you have things like the um, sanitation lines and you have like the sewage holding pools that um, need desperately need to be repaired. So uh, if you might recall in December last year, um, there was heavy rains. And because of the heavy rains and because the sewage holding pools were filled to the max, basically you had sewage overflowing into the streets in many areas of Gaza. So people, you most likely saw the photos of people wading through this mixture of rain and sewage to get to school or work or wherever they were going. And they actually brought um, hasakas, the, the small paddled uh, fishing boat, into the city streets to get to evacuate maybe elderly people or people that couldn't wade through this sewage water. And uh, you especially... Um study or looked into uh, agricultural and fishing kind of uh, those economies in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening to those in the context of prohibited goods and siege and restrictions of movement? Mm -hmm. um, those two sectors, they're some of the, mo the poorest of Gaza's population, 1.7 million people, um, and they're some of the most vulnerable because they're constantly assaulted by the Israeli army or the navy. Mm -hmm. So in the case of fishers, um, under the Oslo Accords, they were granted the right to fish in Palestinian waters up to 20 miles off the coast. Mm -hmm. But over the years, it's been downsized incrementally. There was some sort of agreement called the Bertini Agreement in, I believe it was late 90s or early 2000, in which it was then downsized without Palestinians having a say in the matter to 12 miles. And since then, the Israeli authorities have just unilaterally declared at times at six miles, at times at three miles. Mm -hmm. um, for the fishers, first of all, this reduces their fishing waters to roughly 15% of their waters. But also, um, the majority of the fish are beyond seven miles. So whether it's six miles, whether it's three miles, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. You suddenly have this population of fishers confined to a very small space where there's very few fish and they're vying, they're you know, competing with one another. Mm -hmm. um, many fishers have actually stopped fishing because of this and because of the Israeli um, Navy machine gun fire on boats. So they use heavy duty machine gun fire. I have in my presentations, I, sh I show photos and also video clips of um, what happens when fishers come under attack. Uh, and the photos I show, you know, you have a big fishing trawler whose side is studded with bullet holes, just like you see when you see the photos of Holmes and Rafa, right. and it looks like Swiss cheese. Yeah. It's similar to that. Um, the Israeli Navy also shells fishing boats, and they also routinely abduct fishers. And when they abduct the fishers, then they also take their fishing vessel, and more often than not, it's not returned. And if it is returned, it's usually stripped of its equipment and damaged in many ways. And the fishers have to pay for the return of the vessel from an Israeli port back to Gaza. So, so there's this absurd kind of thing that's going on with individual, uh, you know, people, fishers or farmers or people whose homes are destroyed. Um, and there's some kind of security claims about why they're doing this, why mm -hmm. the Israelis do this. Um, but when you look at it, do you see it as a kind of a, a systemic attack on economic life in, in Gaza? I do. And usually when people, you know, in the corporate media, when you hear about the siege on Gaza, it's usually described merely as an economic siege. Mm -hmm. So the average person listening to that or reading that doesn't get the full sense of how... Um, how damaging it really is because mm -hmm. they're targeting, so they're not only banning almost 100% exports, yeah. so whereas you formerly had strawberries and, and clothing and furniture being exported and now absolutely nothing, it's not only that and severely limiting imports, but also then they're attacking their industries. They, in the 2008-9 attack, something like 700 businesses and factories were damaged or destroyed. Um, because of the ban on imports of raw materials, many factories had to shut down. 
um, these damaged ones or the destroyed ones haven't been able to rebuild, then you have the attacks on the fishing industry and on the farming. One third of Palestinian farmland is inaccessible because, again, another Israeli imposition um, saying this is a no-go zone. If you go there, uh, we will attack, and they do. They've killed tens of farmers, injured hundreds, um, and they also will abduct people that are close to the border. And another aspect of the, the border areas is, so you have farmers um, who could be people that um, are working as paid laborers or people whose families have worked there for generations, and they've lost their land. They've lost their land to the 1967 borders, and then they've, they've lost land within um, Gaza, mm -hmm. And now they've lost their ability to um, to provide for their families, and the ability to provide, in in the case of both farmers and fishers, um, affordable uh, nutrition, right? Yeah. Because the diet was heavily dependent on fish, and of course the variety of vegetables and dates and lemon right. and fruit trees, which are now either have been totally destroyed, or in the case of vegetables, which they can't even grow or or access the land to work. Well, when I when I when I came. Th through, I came through the Erez <laughs> checkpoint mm -hmm. into a town called Beit Hanun, which I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, I was there with another person from the International Solidarity when we were walking, we were kind of walking to look to get a cab. And, uh, and you know, we just kind of looked to our left and there were, there was just a bulldozer, you know, one of these armored bulldozers, you know, just happily bulldozing a field of orange trees, just like these beautiful oh, orange geez. trees just being, you know, bulldozed. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you never saw any orange trees there, but you know, I guess I saw some of the last ones, and it was just like bulldozing away. And we start, we got our cameras out, and we started, uh, you know, to try to take pictures and film. And then w immediately we heard, you know, somebody on a loudspeaker saying, "Stop that!" You know, stop filming. Keep moving. Yeah. So you know, they were watching us from wherever, the, wherever they were watching. You know, someone's always watching in Gaza, yeah. right? Oh yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I definitely saw a lot of what you're talking about as well. Let, I'd like to take a step back, because, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be speaking. Uh, you've done a bunch of uh, talks here in Canada, but you're going to do some speaking in the States as well, in Chicago and Boston and, and other places. Um, you know, one thing that I find with Palestine especially uh, compared to, you know, other situations, whether it's like Haiti or the Congo, I encounter a lot of ignorance about those places. With Palestine, it's, it's much more kind of misinformation. People seem to, th seem to think they know things that aren't actually true, and they have a lot of misconceptions about the nature of the conflict and the situation there. What are some misconceptions that you encounter um, when you're talking to people about this? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. You touched on one misconception uh, when we were talking about fishing, and that's security, mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. all of Israel's acts against Palestinians have to do with security. So, yeah. you know, in the case of the rest of occupied Palestine, Israel's raids on homes and abducting yeah. of people of all ages, including children, there are hundreds of children in Israeli prisons, mm -hmm. that's about security, or their assault on the nonviolent demonstrations in Belain or Nalin or other places is about security or their demolition of Palestinian homes. So uh, I think because of the narrative that's put forth in the corporate media and the misinformation, as you mentioned, um, a lot of people just don't understand, like, th this isn't about security or Israel's bombing of Gaza is not about preventing Hamas rockets, mm -hmm. which is the narrative. Um, so security is one. Another common misconception is that this is about religion mm -hmm. uh, because it's not about Islam or Judaism or Christianity because they all did coexist at one point in Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, the Zionist movement is a political movement mm -hmm. and many Zionists are actually not even, they're, they're secular Jews. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not about Muslims and, and Christians and, and Jews can't get along but that's what many people believe. Mm -hmm. um, and also another misconception is that when there are peace talks that, um, that Israel actually wants peace mm -hmm. um, and that it's the Palestinians' fault because, yeah, they have corrupt leaders, that's for sure, but many countries do, mm -hmm. <laughs> including our own. Yeah. Um, but Palestinians are forced to the peace talk table and they're given absolutely nothing 
and at the same time, the Israeli authorities declare they're going to build more homes, more illegal colonies. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the whole idea that there can be peace when Israel continues to, to do what it does. Right. And then, and so there's a big peace process going on right now, apparently. Um, does that translate to what you're seeing in Gaza at all? I mean, is there any, is there any relationship between what's being agreed on in these talks and people's lives on the ground? Um, most people I know in Gaza would just laugh at the idea at the, of these peace talks because they know in the end the siege is still in place. Mm -hmm. They don't have freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. They can't even access the rest of Palestine. So mm -hmm. people who maybe have relatives in the West Bank or in Jerusalem can't go there. People that want to see their holy sites in Jerusalem or Bethlehem can't go there mm -hmm. from Gaza. Um, even you may have heard of Mahmoud Sarsak. Mm -hmm. He was a, um, a soccer player from Rafa. Mm -hmm. And he was going to, I can't remember the story now, it was a, a few years ago. He was going to the West Bank, um, something to do with soccer tournament. And he was arrested by the Israelis and put in administra administrative detention. Mm -hmm. And he was among the early hunger strikers, and he gained his freedom by hunger striking. But I mean, so this is, there's no freedom of movement, even for the most innocent things like playing soccer or studying, mm -hmm. let alone for more critical things like medical care. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, people in Gaza live day and night under the sounds of drones, right. which are horrible sounds. They are, um, it is psychological warfare because not only are they surveying everything you do, but they're capable, as you know, of precision um, killing. So they live with the sound of drones, with the random Israeli bombings throughout Gaza, with the Israeli warships firing on fissures. Right. There's no sense of any sort of peace. And now, unfortunately, with the complicity of Egypt, it, it's all the worse. Yeah. Um, even the Egyptian army has at times attacked within Gaza. Well, that the, the freedom of movement, I think, is key. Uh, you know, when, when Tarek Louvani and John Grayson were in jail mm -hmm. and uh, in Egypt, they were trying to go to Gaza. And uh, I actually was, was uh, you know, coordinating some of the press and stuff. And, and somebody emailed me and said, well, there's an airport in Gaza. <laughs> why didn't they just fly in the airport? What is all this? Why did, they go, why did they go through Egypt? What is this? This story is suspicious to me. Why would they go through <laughs> Egypt? Wow. And, you know, I had to explain that this airport has not been functioning for many years, that mm -hmm. it was blown up, you know, that it was bombed, and then it was never rebuilt, and that Israel would never allow an airport. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a, a th the, the amount of energy that goes into maintaining the siege, I think, like you said, there's always drones, there's always the sound of drones, the, the amount of money, I think, that Israel spends keeping these people confined, mm -hmm. the amount of diplomacy, um, it's, it's huge. And uh, when, you, when, you look at, when you look at what people are saying about it, like, how do you, where do you begin in terms of trying to, to disentangle that or, or, or try, to, try to reframe a story that's so completely covered in, in deception? And it's, um, I guess it depends on your audience and how willing they are mm -hmm. to challenge their perceptions, their cognitive dissonance, <laughs> you know? It, mm -hmm. it, like, for example, I can think of some people in my town who... They, they'll stick with what they learned, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago about um, Jews and Arabs hating each other. Mm -hmm. And they're not willing to necessarily um, even consider that that's not actually the, the reality. Yeah. Or they'll stick with the, uh, the other narrative, the main killer narrative, which is that Israel's the victim mm -hmm. because of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Nobody else has suffered except for Jews and the Holocaust. And therefore, Palestinians had nothing to do with it. But nonetheless, Israel's still the victim. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I try to do is, um, I'm not an analyst, I'm not a political commentator, I'm, I've, I've spent time, I've gotten to know the people, and I try to convey their humanity mm -hmm. and the challenges they face. And so mm -hmm. I think different things strike different people when I'm talking to mm -hmm. them. So mm -hmm. for some people, it, it's the agriculture 
They can't get over seeing a farmer just trying to harvest his or her parsley mm -hmm. being shot at. They can't get over that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, other times the fishers are seeing the children. I show, I show photos that um, our media won't show. Mm -hmm. You know, so seeing a child badly mutilated by an Israeli bombing or um, shooting really kind of affects somebody and make them think, wait a minute, this, this can't really be about security. So I tr try to just reach people on a personal level and then point out the fact that Israel is the largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid, yeah. billions of dollars a year. Yeah. Israel has nuclear arms. Israel exports weapons. I mean, they have um, a lot of money. They don't need foreign aid. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a lot of power. And there's a power imbalance. That's the other thing to note is that, you know, Palestinians... Yes, there's resistance, which is legitimate because they are occupied. Mm -hmm. But what do they have? They have, okay, so in November 2012, they had stronger rockets than they used to have. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, they have, you know, Kalashnikovs or whatever kind of gun they have. Israel has tanks and warplanes and warships and drones. Yeah. And the whole thing is conducted by remote control in this way. Yeah. Um, and when you said, you know, you, you, you find your, that people are moved when they hear about the humanity of Palestinian people, that they're mm -hmm. people and they go through these things and they suffer like all of us. Um, one person that I find is unmoved by all of this is our Prime Minister, uh, Stephen Harper, who went to um, Israel with great fanfare. And, uh, and he spoke about, um, you know, he spoke about Israel, and he said, you know, how could anyone call it an apartheid state? Um, how could anyone say anything bad about this beacon of freedom and democracy? <laughs> sure. And I, you know, I've seen a little bit, you've seen a, a lot, I think. What does that sound like to you? Does that sound like somebody who's not informed, or does that like so sound like somebody who's, you know, part of this whole process? Ignatieff or something said he wasn't going to lose any sleep over... A bombing in Lebanon, or um, you know, they were all kind of falling over themselves to endorse this. Sure. So, um, so you think it's it's a more of a political support than a matter like you don't think if if Harper saw these things, he probably wouldn't be moved. Oh, of I, I I don't <laughs> think he'd see them, or at least not consciously. But no, I doubt he'd be moved. I mean, the the racism of the the Zionist, the Israeli Zionist. The, um, of course, I'm not speaking about the people necessarily, mm. but the um, politicians, is that many of them don't even see Palestinians as humans. They mm -hmm. really see them as animals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Of course, Avigdor yeah. Lieberman is among the most infamous right. uh, for his horrible statements about driving them into the sea and he'll provide the bus. Right. But um, I would not be surprised if Harper also did not see the humanity of Palestinians, if he also just considered them the other, you know, not worthy of his thought. Uh, do you... Do you see um, any, I mean, any political forces on the horizon that that could go any way to addressing these problems? In Canada, or how do you mean? Globally, in within Israel, within. I don't, to be honest. I mean, the United Nations is a farce. Um, <laughs> And with the tens of resolutions it's issued on the right of Palestinian refugees to return or that Israel must stop occupying the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, um, nothing has been done. They're the world body that can say, yes, we have to humanitarian, humanely bomb Libya, mm -hmm. but they can't do anything when it comes, or they won't do anything when it comes to Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the UN is out, the, the International Criminal Court is out. In fact, I believe our government has threatened Palestinians, you try to go to the ICC about Israel and we'll stop funding you or something to that mm -hmm. effect. Yeah, well, I know these, there have been threats. Yeah, the, the, the aid programs that the EU and Canada and the States have with the Palestinian Authority are uh, also strings of control, right? Yeah. They, they kind of try to stop Palestinians from claiming rights in international forums before they even start. Yeah. So in, in terms of other governments, I mean, many governments in Latin America are supportive of Palestine. So 
hopefully there will be um, maybe more cohesion between Latin American states and that maybe they can be some sort of power rival. But uh, in the end, that's not, you know, too realistic because the power is with America and Europe and Britain um, and even, you know, China. I, I don't know how much support, like, uh, Asian nations really give to Palestine. Mm -hmm. So I'm, that's, that's where I'm not very optimistic. Where I have only a little bit of hope is that more and more people are becoming aware and maybe, maybe we'll actually change our whole system mm -hmm. so that it's not, you know, this, the farce governments that we have mm -hmm. that in the end don't care about their own people, let alone Palestinians. And, and that's what I wonder, you know, with politicians like the ones we have, um, you know, do you think that they are representative of what North Americans think? Like, is that, like, is that racism that we see... Um, you know, a kind of a grassroots racism against Palestinians that people feel, or are they kind of not representative of, of I, this? I would say they're not representative. I think there's maybe um, in North America a great deal of ignorance, mm -hmm. um, and I, I among my, among them, I was also quite ignorant, and I still mm -hmm. am on many issues. But when it came to Palestine a decade ago, I knew absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that wasn't because I, I thought less of Palestinians, it's just I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of ignorance that has been maybe manufactured by our society and mm -hmm. the programming and our news and, you know, what we're allowed to know, yeah. what we're taught in school or not taught. Um, but I wouldn't say that Canadians or even North Americans in general are racist against Palestinians. I think that the governments certainly are mm -hmm. for their own political and, and selfish motives, but... I think that, um, I mean, there's a lot of solidarity amongst Canadians for Palestinians. Well, um, if the problem is information, then I would definitely recommend that uh, you check out uh, Eva Bartlett. <laughs> She's going on tour uh, in, North, in North America talking about uh, Gaza from, uh, and the way it looks, you know, from somebody who's been there for a lot a long time. Uh, do you do you have like a title for the talk usually, or? Um, no, it kind of depends on the venue. But usually, okay. some people say Gaza in crisis. Gaza but in it's crisis. basically, um, you know, it, it's testimonies from Gaza. It's the stories of the people, and I I like to say, you know, it's certainly not about me. That I'm just kind of their microphone, and I, yeah. um, especially since they're so isolated, yeah. feel it's important that there is some sort of connection between people here. And actually, just on a side note, we're working on a project to connect students here with students in Gaza. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, so watch for that project as well. Eva <laughs> Bartlett, um, breaking the siege, <laughs> at least in, in information. Thank you very much Thank for joining you. us, Eva.